Shalom Israel. Welcome to King James Bible University, San Antonio. As we get started today on the lesson of the hour, but he is a leopard. We're going to understand the spiritual breakdown of Naaman out of 2 Kings 5, 1. And so I welcome you and get your Bibles, get your notebooks, and let's get ready to put in some work. Thank you. Okay, let's get started here. I'm going to read for you. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read uh, 2 Kings 5.1. And it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So that's the uh, beginning of this lesson. We're going to kind of break down that scripture and break down some information about Naaman from the spiritual side. But before we get to that, I want you to take a look at this video from Moody Bible Institute. This is, uh, it was a five minute clip. I only took a minute of it. And you'll notice how uh, the Gentiles view the Bible as a bunch of stories. And if you Think on the way they think you Naaman never get inside. was highly respected by his fellow men. And he was known to, them, to be a personal to friend of the king. So let's take a look being here. Rich and, and having uh, an important job be had been all that was necessary to guarantee happiness. Naaman's home would have been a wonderful place to live, but unfortunately, Naaman's home was a place of sorrow. Naaman had leprosy, a dreaded sickness for which there was no cure. Naaman's wife and the other members of his family were very sad, knowing that day by day Naaman was slowly dying. Even the servants felt sorry for Naaman and his wife, and one of the servants in particular wondered if she could help. She knew about the true and living God, and about Elisha, the prophet of God that lived in the land of her childhood. The servant girl felt sure that if Naaman went to the prophet, he could be cured of his leprosy. So one day she gathered up her courage and told her mistress about the prophet who lived in Israel, and what she felt could be done about the sorrow in their home. Naaman's wife had never heard of God, and yet as she sat there and listened to the servant girl tell of the wonderful things that God could do, new hope came into her heart. Naaman's wife went to tell her husband the news. Naaman listened intently. He had captured this servant girl on one of his raids into Israel. Why was she trying to help him? A God that could cure leprosy? Could such a thing be true? It was his only hope. So Naaman agreed with his wife that he would have to go and try to find the prophet. But he was a Syrian who had attacked people in Israel. How willing would they be to help an enemy? Perhaps? Okay, here we go. Now we see on this uh, scripture, let's read it again. We got to learn the truth about Naaman the Syrian. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Spirit of God had given deliverance or salvation unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So we understand that that is a very serious issue there. But what we have to discover and understand is what does the name Naaman mean? So I'm not going to necessarily be focused too much on the man, but the meaning of the name. Okay? Because in order to understand the spiritual side of this scripture and what God is saying to us, we have to understand these meanings and the spiritual meanings of these people. So... Uh, let's look at the origin of the word Naaman. We're going to move to Genesis 46 chapter, excuse me, Genesis chapter 46 verse 21. Okay, as we get to Genesis 46 21 and it reads, And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, and Beker, and Ashbel, and Gera, and Naaman, Ehi, and Rosh, and Mupin, and Hupin, and Arg, that is Genesis 46, 21. Genesis, excuse me, Numbers 26, 38, dealing with the sons of Benjamin and after their families. The sons of Benjamin, after their families of Bela, was the family of the Belites, of Ashbel, the family of the Ashbelites, and of Ahiram, the family of the Ahiramites. And if we read on down to, skip on down to Numbers 26, 40, we see something, because it's going to break down Benjamin's uh, son Bella and his children and their family in the uh, lineage of Benjamin. Now, the B-E-L-A-H, Bella in Genesis 
4621 is the same BELA, same person, in Numbers 2640. And it says, And the sons of Bela, and Bela is the son of Benjamin, were Ard and Naaman. Of Ard, the family of the Ardites, and of Naaman, the family of the Naamites. And so we see from the Bible that the name Naaman is a Hebrew name. It has a definite meaning and purpose. Okay? Uh, in Genesis 46, 21, it says that Naaman was of the sons of Benjamin. Now, we, you must understand in Hebrew culture that once the grandson got to a certain age as a man, he was called the son of his grandfather. And so Naaman is listed as of the sons of Benjamin, but technically he's the grandson of Benjamin, as we see in Numbers 2640. So first of all, we have to understand what does Naaman mean? We're dealing with the word, the Hebrew name Naaman. We see that Naaman comes from Benjamin. Benjamin is the last son of Israel. Benjamin means um, of the right hand, okay? Son of, son of the right hand pertaining to uh, Israel and pertaining to the covenant of God is very powerful. So son of the right hand has a son called Pleasantness. So the foundational name for Naaman is Pleasantness. So Naaman, Pleasantness, is the head of the family of the Naamites who are Hebrews who should be exemplifying pleasantness in their lifestyle toward the Most High or toward the covenant. They should be living in, in order with God's commandments. And so that gives us a history, a little brief history of the name Naaman. And so I want you to go do your research and kind of dig this thing out because we got to have spiritual meanings and understandings of these words. And that's how the Bible is laid out. You won't get this listening to uh, Gentiles teach the Bible from their um, carnal way of thinking. Okay, we move to the next slide and we see this term so we understand that Naaman means pleasantness Naaman is a Hebrew name uh, and so forth and Naaman is a Hebrew according to what we just read now let's deal with who are the Syrians what makes up a person a Syrian who are they so first of all we got to look in the history of the scriptures and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 10 verse 11 and 12 okay in Genesis 10 which is people call it the table of nations we see in the midst of a breakdown about uh, the sons of Japheth we get to verse 11 in Hebrews 10 so Hebrews 10 10 is dealing with Japheth in the midst of Japheth we see the introduction of a man called Asher and it says out of that land went forth Asher and built Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kela and the resident between Nineveh and Kela the same is a great city so you have to understand well who is this Asher Asher is not Japhet Asher comes from the children of Shem so we got to move on to Genesis 10 22 because we got to find out who are the Assyrians and who are the Assyrians it's the same people all right it says the children of Shem so as it begins to name the children of Shem, it says, The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So the guy who built the city of Nineveh, where we find later in your studies, you'll find out when you get to Jonah, and other books that uh, Israel, the Israelites are held captive in Nineveh. All right? Nineveh was built by a Shemitic man called Asher. Now we have Assyria. Assyria comes from Aram, who is also the brother of Asher. Excuse me, let me reverse that. Syria comes from Aram, and Assyria comes from Asher. Assyria means a step, and that's what that word means. It comes from Asher, and of course Asher is the second son of Shem. And Syria, these are all the same people, means exalted. These come from Aram. So both 
the Assyrians or Assyria, Assyrians are Shemites. So we can just use that term Syria to mean, you know, those who are full of themselves. So Assyrian is the, those who are exalted in their own mind, full of themselves. All right. Think they're better than everybody else. So let's keep moving. We're introduced to the word Syrian long before we get to uh, Second Kings. We find it here in Genesis 25, 20. Remember, Abraham, God made a covenant with Abraham and that covenant went down to Isaac and Abraham had his servant vowed that he would go back to his homeland and find Isaac, a wife of his brethren. And so here we find in Genesis 25, 20, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Pandanaram the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So, um, Rebekah, the wife of Isaac, who is the seed of promise unto Abraham, she's from Bethuel. Bethuel means house of God, like Bethel. Of Pandanaram. Pandanaram means the way of Syria, the way of Syria. And she's the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So, now, not only is the Syrian a people, but the Syrian is a title. It deals with a character. So when we break down and understand what a, the Syrians or Assyrians mean, it's a problem of being self-exalted. Okay, they have a certain way of thinking. They have a certain sense of reasoning. So a person is a Syrian when they're full of themselves and they reason based on their opinion, their attitude, their mindset, their flesh. And so we see that Israel is always getting in trouble and into conflicts when dealing with Syria, the exalted, and the gods of Syria. Okay? So, like for instance, we can be full of ourselves. So when you watch, take for instance, the, I think that show that was about the Bulls and Michael Jordan, there came a point in reason, yeah, Jordan was great. But Jordan didn't have a whole lot of friends. He wasn't the friendliest person to his teammates. In some sense, even though he was successful in winning, some may have thought, man, this guy was kind of behaving like a Syrian because he definitely was full of himself. It's kind of like uh, there's a joke I remember hearing from Red Fox, one of them Red Fox albums my father had when I was little. And... Uh, he was talking about a pretty woman. And so he says, sometimes, you know, women can be full of themselves and men too, but he's talking about women. And he says, you know, you see a pretty, pretty, very beautiful young woman and you're trying to, to introduce yourself. And that woman is turning her nose up at you and, and walking around like, like she's the cream of the crop. He says, remember, she got boogers in her nose. In other words, no matter how we, how highly we think of ourselves, our poop does stink. And so we got to make sure that we're not operating in the spirit and mindset of a Syrian because the Syrians are full of themselves. They, they, they're full of their own way of thinking, their way of reasoning. All right. Now, uh, in Judges 10, 6, we find a problem with Israel. And it says the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And so what they did was <clears throat> after Joshua died, they began to go after the way of these other nations. And so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Asheroth, the gods of Syria. So they began to get themselves full of the doctrine and ideals of, of, of the Syrian people. Now you got to understand, even though <clears throat> biologically Syrians are of Shem, God only has a covenant with Israel. Okay? And so Israel can be acting like a Syrian, living like a Syrian. But on natural sense, God's covenant is not with Syria because the Syrians were the enemies of Israel. God's covenant is with Israel, okay? Those that are of the promise of the spirit, who walk in the spirit, who don't put any confidence in the flesh. If we're putting confidence in our flesh, whether it, in whatever means it is, and we have to check ourselves, if we're putting confidence in this fleshly life that we have and thinking we're something, then we're, we're acting like Naaman, so to speak. And we have to be very careful and we have to bring that flesh down. 
All right. The only thing that flesh has to be before the most high is to be put to death. Remember, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And God is not having a covenant with flesh and blood. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So when you deal with the term Syrian, always think in your mind, people that are full of themselves, full of pride, full of arrogance, their way is the right way. They can do no wrong. All right. And we're going to kind of discover this because this is going to get Naaman in some trouble. Because as we study this scripture, we understand that Naaman had a problem with this, but he was a leper. And you have to understand why was he a leper and why was he in trouble? Okay, as we take a look here, we're going to read from 2 Samuel 13, 38. Remember, we're talking about the curse of leprosy and also the reasoning of a Syrian. So the first example I'm going to read to you is how or, or what takes place when you dwell in the land of Syria. All right. It says, so Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there three years. So after Absalom had killed his brother, and he was in exile from Jerusalem and from uh, Judah. He goes, or from Israel, because it's one nation state at that time. He flees and he goes and he dwells among the Syrians. Now, we understand that biologically the Syrians are, are uh, the Chaldeans, okay? Remember, Abraham came out of the Chaldeans, all right? Same people. Now, Absalom is over here with these people. We got to understand that these people don't necessarily serve the God of Israel because they are, they have their own way of doing things. But let's pick up in 2 Samuel 15, 8. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode in Jeshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. So while Absalom was living in Syria, in that city, uh, he was learning the ways of the Syrians, which, you know, they, they flow with the way of his own mindset, his own heart. Because remember, how can two walk together but they, except they agree? And so Absalom is living in Syria. He's comfortable there. He's, he's building up himself in Syria, getting full of the knowledge of Syria and the way of Syria. And then he vows a vow after some time that he would return back to his home. Hopefully his father wouldn't be mad and he made a vow to serve the Lord. But you remember, he had an ulterior motive. His motive of coming back would eventually manifest in him trying to make a coup and steal the heart of Israel away from David and, uh, you know, set himself up as king and, and get David overthrown from the throne. So you got to understand what David means. David means uh, he that is on the throne. So David is also a title. And David represents the Messiah, the true Messiah on the throne. And so Absalom is flesh always trying to overthrow the spirit of Christ. And that's what that is. Okay. I digress. Let us move on. We're dealing with the curse of leprosy. Leprosy, uh, spiritually speaking, is... When a person is profane from the truth. So when a person is profane from the truth, they're a leper. Also, leprosy is um, white flesh. Leprosy can also be called swine's flesh. Okay? So those are the different meanings of leprosy or a spot of white. Okay? So when a person is profane, when a person profanes the truth or is profane, from the truth, they are a leper. So don't necessarily think of leprosy simply as the skin ailment, okay? The spiritual meaning is profane the truth. So when a person profanes the truth, they're a leper. All right, let's move on. Now, the priest shall look on the plague of the skin of the flesh. Remember, first natural, then spiritual. So God set up a law in Israel, and this is part of the law of leprosy. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in the sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. So when a person is a leper in their flesh, they're unclean. When a person is profaning truth, they are unclean. 
when a person is resisting truth, they are unclean. I'm going to stick with the spiritual side of this thing, all right? Now, let's keep moving. In Numbers 12, 9 and 10, we see a situation that happened to Miriam. Miriam began, to, her and Aaron began to come up against Moses. And remember, Moses is, is akin to Yahawashai in his role as a prophet in Israel. So uh, they began to speak against Moses and make an accusation against Moses. And the Bible says the Lord heard them and he was angry. So we're going to pick up in Numbers 12, 9. It says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed. So remember, God heard him. He called Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to the tabernacle. He gives us, he tells Moses and talks to them directly what they what he's about to do. He's mad, then he leaves. All right. So it says the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, against Moses, I mean against Miriam, Aaron, and Aaron, and uh the most high departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And remember, Miriam became leprous, Miriam became unclean. Be quiet. She profaned the truth. Okay. She came against Moses and she was white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. So leprosy is a sentence. All right. And it makes you unclean and it's a death sentence and it puts you out of uh, the camp of Israel. Now I want to move to another example of leprosy. We have uh, the king of Judah, Uzziah. And so in 2 Chronicles 26, 19, it speaks of Isaiah being wroth. Now, before we get to that verse, just to give you a little background history in 2 Chronicles 26, okay? In 2 Chronicles 26, Isaiah had done great works to deliver Israel from the enemies of the Philistines. And he had overthrown them and broke down the wall of Ashdod and did great things and became great and... He began to become a man of renown. He, he, he was chief of the fathers of the mighty men. He was great. He was doing great things. He had great men with him. And they were conquering and defeating the enemies of Israel. All right. Now they came to a point where nobody could stand before Uzziah. All the enemies of Israel were being conquered. He even went to the extent... So as we take a look at Naaman, remember what Naaman means. Naaman means pleasantness. Naaman is a Hebrew. Naaman deals with the sons of Jacob. Okay? And so Naaman, who is a leper, goes to the house of Elisha or Elisha. And let's take a look at this. 2 Kings 5, 9, and 10. This teaching today is basically an overview of that we'll have to go deeper later on because there are some things that have to be brought out. But I want to get you to understand, and we have to understand the general knowledge of this area. All right. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So we got to understand here is Pleasantness, who is now cursed with leprosy, goes to the house of Elisha. What does Elisha mean or Elisha mean? It means God is salvation. So he goes to the place where God is salvation. And God is salvation sends a message through a messenger. God of salvation doesn't personally come to Naaman to do anything. He sends a word. He sends the truth. He sends a directive. He sends the gospel or a message to him to go do something, okay? To deal with his flesh and his sin problem. Because remember, leprosy is a sin issue. It is a curse because of his mindset and the things that he was doing and how he was full of himself. So, God of salvation sends the messenger who comes with the message. So the gospel or the message to Naaman is go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall come again to thee and you shall be clean. That's simply, that's simply it. There's nothing else. Just follow this instruction. Do what I'm telling you to do. If you go do what I'm telling you to do completely and fully, then you will be delivered. You will be saved. You will be healed from your sin. You will be set free from your captivity of leprosy. So remember, he had to go to the Jordan 
and he had to wash not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven times. Now, remember, Jordan has a great significance in Israel. As uh, the Israelites were going into the promised land, they had to cross the Jordan. All right. From the wilderness to promise, you got to go through the Jordan. As Yahweh Shai was about to start his ministry, he had to condemn his flesh in the Jordan. For John the, John the Condemner, John the Baptist, was baptizing or condemning with the knowledge of the word at the Jordan. And he had to get into the water. And we're going to find out. And most of you know what water means and river means. All right. So the Jordan is significant in our history. Okay. And so now, this is a simple message. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall come again to you and you shall be clean. Simple message. You want to go from being unclean, being profane, being swine's flesh, <laughs> being filthy. <laughs> That's leprosy spiritually. All right. From being like a ghost. You see like the pictures of those guys I got on the first page uh, from the twins from the Matrix. They were, in essence, lepers. Okay? They were unclean in the film. They are lepers. All right? That's why I put their picture to put on this slide. That's the simple message. Let me move back to Naaman. Now, when he got the message, we have to look at it, brothers and sisters. When we get the word, when the word comes to us, what do we do? Do we obey it fully? Do we meditate on it? Do we think about it? Or we just hear it and go our way. All right. The only way change is going to come to us. We have to follow the message. What the messenger says. What the spirit says. The, the, the believer has to believe. He has to obey. He has to follow. What Christ says to us. We got to do. So here we go. God of salvation has told this man. Go down to the Jordan and watch seven times. Go get into the knowledge of Israel. Now let's look at his logic. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, mm. so he's angry. He's full of rage. He's raging. Kind of like, remember we talked about Isaiah? When Isaiah was corrected with the truth, man, don't take that censor. Don't come in here and do that. The Bible says that uh, Isaiah began to be wroth with the priest and end up being cursed. Naaman gets the message. He don't understand what God is doing. So sometimes in our ignorance and when we're full of ourselves and we don't understand the precepts and understand what God is saying, we can become angry and frustrated. Naaman is now angry. He's frustrated and he's mad and he leaves the house where salvation is and he goes his way. He has no intent to follow what's being said. He wants to live in his flesh and his anger. And he explains, and he begins to say out loud, and he says, remember, I thought, so here's his reasoning as a Syrian, I thought he, Elisha, or the prophet, I thought the God of salvation would surely come out to me. See, he wants God on his terms. He wants salvation on his terms. He wants deliverance on his terms, not on God's terms. Surely he will come out to me and stand. So you won't salvation to come stand before you look, look at the logic of this man surely he will come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God now remember Naaman don't know the way of the Lord he don't know the way of the spirit he don't know the way of the truth because he's been living in Syria exalted in, in the works of his flesh exalted in the works of serving the king of Syria and we'll have to break that down later in another video if you're a little more, get a little deeper on this thing. See, he's full of himself. So he says, man, I, this man should have came out, stood before me, called on his God, put his hand over me, and then, whack, miracle, boom, I'm healed. Put his hand over the place and recover the leper. He said, I would be recovered and a great miracle be sown. And I could have this testimony, man, God came out and met me and healed me. And I'm a great, you know, not something humble. It, it'd be a sense of pride, man. The prophet of God came out to me. Look what he did for me. You know, and so 
he's feeding his ego and he's mad and his ego is wounded and he's mad. Now look at his reasoning. Verse 12. Are not the Abana and the Farfar, the Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now we got to break this down spiritually. Rivers means knowledge, understanding, doctrines, philosophies. That could be rivers. So he's saying, are not the doctrines, philosophies, knowledge, wisdom of Syria, Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, better than the knowledge not simply the knowledge, all the knowledge of Israel. Isn't what we got over here in this flesh world better than what God is offering? That's his mindset. Because to get what God is offering, he has to humble himself. And he's mad now. He's frustrated now. He's ticked off that he got to come down from his horse and get down into the water. He's got to bury that flesh. He got to bury that old man. He got to condemn that flesh. And he's upset because he thought he, the prophet going to meet him on his terms and do some miracle. And he going to walk out and he can be even prouder. So look at the logic of, of Naaman. Because he's been reared in Syria. He believes in his mind because all he knows is the way of Syria. That the way of Syria, the way of the flesh is better than the way of of the spirit of God in Israel because who is the source of all the knowledge of Israel the most high the spirit of truth the spirit of Christ the word all right the most high himself and so that's his dilemma he says can I go back to what I used to do and wash myself in my Damascus insight and Damascus way of thinking and be clean no you can't be clean on your own terms we can't cleanse ourselves. Has a fish ever been captured? Have you ever went fishing and the fish cleaned himself? Before he was cooked. No, a man had to catch the fish. We had to gut the fish, scale the fish, season the fish, fry the fish, that we could enjoy the fish. So you can't go wash in the old filth of Damascus and think you're going to be transformed from being a leper to being clean. You're going to still be unclean if you stay in Damascus knowledge. You're going to still be unclean if you stay in the rivers of Damascus. So he turns away and went away in rage. But thank God for his servants. Thank God for some humble servant who was listening. And it says, and his servant came near and spake to him and said, my father, if the prophet the prophet speaks on behalf of the Most High. So he speaks the word of God. So my father, if the word of God had been, if the prophet, the man had come out and told you to do some great thing. If he told you to come out and give $200 and do three flips and donate $1,500, you're going to get a house, you know, do this and that and that and that and this and that. And, and you're going to get a new car. You know, what they do in the church. You know, you know, if the prophet came and told you all these prophetic things, I have this vision that the next one down at the altar who who throws the money of fifteen hundred dollars at the altar, you're gonna get a new house, you know. That's what he was expecting. Remember, he even brought money. I didn't even get to it. He brought money to give to the prophet because he thought it was money that was gonna get him delivered. He thought he could buy it. He thought he could do it his way. And you'll find out later the prophet didn't want none of that money because that ain't how God works. God operates by the spirit and by faith. So his servant came to him and said, man, father, master, if the prophet had told you to do some great work, like give a million dollars and you had a million dollars, you got thousands and thousands of talents of gold and silver. If he asked you for that bag of silver to heal you, wouldn't you have done it? If he told you to run a mile, 10 miles, and, or whatever, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean? The word of God gave you simple instructions. Nothing too deep, 
nothing too heavy wouldn't you just wash and be clean and, and simply follow the instructions of the spirit of God and be healed look at the wisdom of God God, is, God speaks to us spiritually but in a lot of ways it's simplicity it simplifies our life if we would heed it but life gets complicated because the flesh the Syrian is always talking the Syrian is always speaking remember we did that teaching two weeks ago about the heart and the mouth all right, that Syrian in the heart is always trying to get his way. And that's why we got to render that flesh dead to God and bury that flesh. And that's what Naaman had to do. And so I'm kind of just, this is just an overview, brothers and sisters. We're not going too deep on this teaching right now. We can hit it later on, but I just want to put this in your spirit. As we look at the, so as we look at the last slide, we see that Naaman had to perform an action and it reads second Kings 514 then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and he was clean so in order to get that transformation from being a leper for being unclean from being profane from being swine's flesh from being what he was because of his sin. Naaman had to condemn the logic and the knowledge of Syria and he had to kill the Syrian by drowning him in the knowledge of truth. So he goes down into the Jordan, <clears throat> complete obedience to what God was saying through the prophet. And as he obeyed with full faith and as he put to death the deeds of his body and the deeds of the flesh and his mindset through obedience he was able to be restored like a little child remember Jesus said except we be as little children we shall no wise inherit the kingdom of God and also um, the death of the Syrian is crucial because that was the only way he could be made clean and Paul says it like this in Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so when we see this, that is in a nutshell what had to be done. To be crucified is to put to death the flesh. But to live is Christ. And so that's what we have to do. We have to move from being Syrians to being disciples in all things unto the Most High God in Christ. So I bid you adieu. I pray that you be blessed through this teaching. I pray that the, pray that the simplicity of it will be a blessing to you and to me also as it is. And uh, we have so many more precepts and things to break down and different things. Um, I just had so much more stuff given to me recently in this subject. I didn't want to bring it all out right now. So I got to take time and ingest it, but I pray that you be blessed. I pray that you join us again and learn, 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 seek the truth, study, show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray that we all can learn from this example not from some child story, but from the struggle of a Hebrew man having to put down himself and put it to death and bury it constantly in the knowledge of God that that new man could come up. So without any more talking, I'm going to bid you a good night and a shalom. This is Elder Phil signing out.